Welcome back to the Social Impact Level Up podcast. This is where we blur the lines between business, nonprofit, and impact. I'm your host, Wendy V, and I'm a social impact strategist here to help you build a successful and sustainable legacy of social change. In this week's episode, we're going to hear from a social entrepreneur who has been on a journey to change the world just like you. If you are interested in social entrepreneurship, this is the place for you. Let's jump right into this week's episode. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Social Impact Level Up podcast. So I always think of education and what happens in schools and the word learning as just something that, you know, progresses through the life course. And I think maybe some people don't think about it that way, but I found this wonderful voice that was talking about how all of the things that you're doing, whether it's your emotions, your mental health, the relationships you keep, how you use your time, um, your brain space, all these things come together with the things that you're doing in your work. But all of that was rooted in her work in education. And I'm very excited to introduce you to this wonderful person. So Future Kane is our guest for this episode, and she is the CEO of Future of SCL. And she'll tell you a little bit more about who she is and how she makes an impact. But I just wanted to say I am when I heard her voice the first time, I was forever transformed after. And so I hope that all of the listeners who hear this episode, you will as well. And you'll make sure that you continue to hear her voice because it is such a powerful one. So, okay, future. Now with that intro, I'm going to turn it over to you and tell you if you could tell our audience who you are and how you make an impact. Ooh, that's a big intro. Okay, so thank you so much for those beautiful, kind words. Who am I and how do I make an impact? I am a being on this planet learning and trying to figure it out because nobody has it all figured out at the end of the day. And I believe if people are more socially, emotionally intelligent, I believe if people are more well, I believe if people are in spaces where they feel safe to be their authentic selves, that we can co-create beautiful things And that's what I am actively working with people and organizations and teams to do is optimize the human potential because I think we're leaving so many things out and we're not looking at things through a drone view. Some people are standing on balconies. Some people are still in the basement and we have to highlight what are the things that we can do. There's opportunities of growth all around us and how many of us have acknowledged that at this point. Oh, I love that. And I know you're working with organizations now, but this is not where you started. You started with the little ones in the classroom because social emotional learning has really been kind of an education sector thing. And you are translating it out into how it's practical for organizations to use, which I think is the innovation. (laughs) When I hear you say it, you say it so beautifully, but I don't think that people really understand that this is not, it it makes a natural sense. it's a natural home for that work, but it doesn't always get done in that environment. So can you talk about that bridging and how you even decided to, to go in this direction? Okay. I, what's funny about this is 2020 was happening. And at that time I was at, still in this school district, I was at the district level and I was the director of social, emotional learning and community outreach at the time when 2020 hit. And I came on just to say, how could I serve in social media? Because I wasn't even on social media until 2020 for the most part. You won't find any posts from me. I don't even think I put anything out in 2019. And uh, I said, how can I serve? Because I knew, I knew I had told my leadership team after we went down, which at, was on March 13th of 2020. And we had to come back as leadership team to figure, figure out the playbook that nobody had. And at that point in time, I said, you mark my words, we are going to go into a mental health crisis. And we went into a mental health crisis. And being proactive and preventative, because of the, the area I try to function in, I said, what could I do to help humanity? So I went in and put out posts. I put out a post a week of a quote to help people get through a minute, a moment, an hour, a day, possibly, because we all didn't know what we were living through. And then George Floyd happened. 
And when George Floyd happened, I said, okay, the conversations that I've been having privately off of line, I now need to come out here and help, help to educate, help to build bridges, help to ease some pain that people is, are functioning through right now or failing through, not even functioning at some point. Some of us are just surviving, not a, even thriving at that point. And then people started saying, hey, can you do this? Can you do that? And then I had people reaching out, hey, can you do consulting for us? Can you come do coaching? So my future of SEL business was born from people saying, can we get your help? Where I wasn't planning on doing that at all because I was still working in the school district and, and then I went to the work at the state level. But it was at that time that people were reaching out and then saying, how can you help us? I said, okay. And then Future of ICL was birthed. That's such a wonderful origin story because it's accidental based on the market's request for a solution mm -hmm. that you knew you could provide. <laughs> so it was a no-brainer for you as an entrepreneur to say, yeah, I'll take on this, this new project or this new scope, whatever you got. Uh, because you already were doing that work essentially right. anyway. Right. I was doing yeah. the work already. Yeah, that's, a, that's such a great story. And when you were thinking about, okay, well, what's the difference in taking this from an organization, mm -hmm. like a school district, which is very structured and rigid. Yes. And if you haven't worked in that environment, you may not understand fully how prescriptive it is down to like every day of what happens. And then going to an organization like a business or a nonprofit mm -hmm. that others that you've worked with since then, what did you have to do to translate this social emotional learning and, and teaching people about this concept so that they were able to adapt it and, and absorb it in that environment? Okay, so I'm big on you have to assess where people are at because there's not as much as people want to say it's a one size fits all. No, it's not because every organization has different people in it. The cultures are different. The people are different. The systems are different. The policies, the procedures, the practices are all different. So how do you apply it? What I do know is that there's not a human being that's adult, an adult that are maybe, I'd probably say 30 and up, because I would say the, the people who are 30 and less probably had the opportunity to have socially emotional learning be highlighted in the schools where there's a, a lot of people, I would say 30 years and up in the workplaces that have not had those skill sets taught to them. And the reality is, is we can all take a growth in our own self-awareness and how are we feeling, what our biases are, how they are then applied to the lens that we see and project out to the decision that we're making in any organization. On top of, we can all harness and build relationships a little bit better to collaborate, to care about the social impact. So it's putting those same things into your own organization or you as a person and a team to say, how do I harness those things? Because if you have a broader sense of self-awareness, there's going to be things inevitably in the organization that you're going to see that you didn't even see or hear before. You as a leader are going to be more open to the intersectionalities of beings and people coming to talk to you, which is only going to build the trust, which is only going to build the safety, which is only going to build a greater culture and a sense of belonging that's inevitably going to help retention and profits. Yeah, and it, it's like the environment and the person are invited to finally come together because yes. what I found when I left the government was that a lot of organizations, especially that operate as systems, are not made for the people they serve or Correct. the people that work in them to thrive. And it's just a bottom line, the way they function, the way management works, the way progression works, like the way professional development works, like everything is more about um, continuing to churn the work versus really the quality outcomes for all. And Correct. what you're really saying is we can achieve quality outcomes for all. Why not all of us thrive and the system thrive and all of it work together? <laughs> right. I, I'm saying we all can. Why can't this be a win-win? A win for the system, a win for the people. I, I think what is alarming is 
we're seeing news headlines. You're, you're seeing it over and over again since 2020. People have been brought into a new enlightenment, a new awareness. And then they have these non-negotiables that are, I'm not showing up anymore if I have to coat check my being at the door to come into a system and mask up, not, you know, facial mask, but literally mask up who I am so that I could come here to pretend and lose pieces of myself while sitting at this job to serve the system, but I'm not serving myself. So it has to be a, a reciprocity of a both and instead of just a one way, because we're also seeing a lot of those organizations, the retention levels have gone down from what it was before, because if, if it's not aligning to the people's values and purposes in life, then they're saying, then I don't need to be here. I will go find another job. So for me, I think some organizations need to consider, okay, what, what is your retention? What is the culture? How are people feeling? Look at your health, the health benefit. How, how many people are taking days off? Have you seen an increase in the things that you have to pay for? Those are all indicators of, you know what, maybe we need to do a culture assessment and have somebody come in and facilitate. Maybe we need to look at the system and care more about the human being, because if the human can't serve here, then we can't serve the people that our organizations here to serve either. Yeah, it, 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 there's so much truth in that. And I think that even organizations that do assessments sometimes ignore the outcomes or the results mm -hmm. because they're not favorable, but they don't have solution that really work or they try something it doesn't work and they and they go oh well, well we tried that one thing that one right. <laughs> that seemed to work. Right? but i i love what you're talking about with the organization you know it, you will see that the metrics that are talking about um poor outcomes will go lower and your outcomes like profit and things you want to be higher employee your retention stuff mm -hmm. like that will go higher if you pay attention to these kinds of environmental factors in your workforce and all of the other things that are going on with the organization to support the workers and support your organization. <laughs> so it's a, it should be a win-win, right? And it, it seems like, you know, yeah, you can think about it. Like you were saying, it's really high level. It's kind of like meta. Maybe people are going, well, how does this really work? Or what are we talking about here? So can we get if we want to go one level deeper, so we're going like my you know, 50,000 foot level to our 10,000 foot level. Mm -hmm. If you were going to say, okay, I have some solutions for you. These are the types of things we would engage in. Is it like coaching or what do people do in the organization to, to make it better? <laughs> like you can't just put a bandaid no. on a broken organization. So, and we all know that don't work. So no, it doesn't work. It works for a little bit. It does work for a little bit. Okay. How long, how long do you want it to work for? I'm, I'm all for working with organizations that are in it for a systems approach, not just for the here and now, but for long, long-term goals. Okay. Now, obviously having short-term goals in there, but seriously, we're thinking very future led. Now, with that, what I would say to any organization is we go back to the assessment. So I'm technically a certified culture facilitator and assessor. So we could come in then and go through the culture and meet with the people. Now, I've seen a lot of organizations that do surveys and surveys are only as good as the day and the moment and as candid as people want to be with the actual survey. I've seen some surveys where it's internal, well, people don't feel vulnerable and trust the system enough to be honest with what the survey is asking them because they know what possible repercussions could happen if you see honesty. Or in the diversity part, there's only four of us who are brown and we check one of the brown boxes. So you're going to know it's one out of four. <laughs> right? Seriously. Okay. So people are like not, not doing that one. So then that's why is coming in as a facilitator, we do meetings, literally virtual meetings or in-person meetings, and then we disaggregate the data. So you really won't know who's saying what. Why? Because it shouldn't be the system of improvement shouldn't be got you, right? Like it's one out of four. We know who we're going to who said that. We don't, we don't want it to be that. If we're seeking truths, then we have to seek truths in order to get better 
not to crucify people. So it would be uh, starting with a facilitation and then giving an assessment. And it's a detailed assessment that then says, okay, here's, here's the areas and here's some solutions. Solutions can and have been coming in to do workshops. Now, it's not going to be a two-hour workshop and, hey, we're good to go, okay? It is several part workshops over a period of time because that's how the system changes. You have to keep doing the work. The work just doesn't get done in a day. So it might take weeks and months, which is fine, but you have to build the people up to the place where they need to be. So it's then doing workshops. It is doing some coaching. And then along the way, there's consulting because why? You're not an expert in it and it's okay, but you are seeking expertise to help you move along the path, which is what people are seeking. So it sounds like it's like a little bit of everything. Well, yeah, the <laughs> the awesome. You got to take all the things in the tool belts and put it at the problem. Because right. it, it, what we used to say in the government, it was complex problems require complex solutions. They do. If it was a simple solution, we would have probably already done it. Right. Like the band-aid probably would have worked if whatever right. band-aid we decided to put on. So I, I think that that's a great way to, to characterize it. And um, in the, the idea of it being a sustainable change, right? Like something that, it's not a short-term solution, but it, when you get to another part, you're going to continue to re-up whatever those solutions and whatever tools you pull out of your toolbox because you're going to be at like a completely different point you after are. you've implemented a couple of things. Well, the other thing I think about too is how many times, whether it's in schools or in organizations, let's even take DEI, that there's that one person in the organization that does it. Okay. Now, even if it's not DEI, if it's wellness, if it's, well, they lead that pillar. If you are putting the one thing, whether it's DEI, whether it's wellness, whatever, on one human being, how sustainable is it going to be? Seriously. And if that person leaves, now what? Yeah, or if you decide to cut the funding for their, their position, which happens somehow all the time to wellness and things like that. Right, <laughs> right. So now everybody, because wellness or DEI impacts everybody. That's the reality. So then if, if the funding gets cut for that, or if the person decides to leave, then the impact of that is felt by every single person. So because we didn't want a sustainable system, now we have harmed unintentionally all these people who their wellness is going to be impacted. All of these people who their safety and belonging is now going to be impacted because, oops, we just didn't have the money. Or, oh, that person just couldn't take it anymore being the only person here. And because we didn't go through a systems approach, now this is the result. Yeah, the lack of access to whatever that expertise or service was is, is a, you know, it, it's almost like you can't quantify it sometimes because, yes, it might have been a $60,000 position or whatever in your budget, but it's also all of the expertise of that individual Correct. person who is in the organization. This is where you get back to that, like, fit of individual organization and how do you continue to value both, right? right. Both are important. Right. That's <laughs> important. Yeah. So I, I love this, uh, just uh, like where, where your brain is on all of this, if I could talk to you about these things okay. all day, but I want to hear from you and your experience of um, social entrepreneurship and starting this business accidentally. I'm sure your tendency to help others because way before start, started, at least when you were, became a teacher, but when did you really decide that your purpose in life, your calling or what you were going to do with yourself was to serve others. And that, you know, what, what was that like for you as, as an individual? Gosh, I think I was, uh, my friends were always coming to me. If I could remember, I would say, you know, the middle school years and definitely high school, I could remember. And then, you know, college, but I'm saying if I'm going back to my earliest, they were always coming to me for several things. And a few of the several things that they were coming to me for was for me to listen and hear them. Two, for if they didn't feel comfortable coming to me for protection because they knew that I would stick up and advocate 
for them and keep them safe. So from an early age, I had people saying to me, you're, you're a safe spot that I could come to and you can hear me and you maybe could see me in other ways that people couldn't. So I think that is then I was serving in that way human anyway. I was serving the humans anyway, right? And I know that sounds weird. They're like the humans, okay? Like, like I'm an alien on this. I dropped down as alien on this planet and I'm serving the human. But it, that's what it was from an early age. And then I said, okay, it's, it's constantly, it's always about serving, right? I got into education not because I'm here to be a millionaire. What everybody knows educators don't get paid, right? Like, I think everybody's very clear on, I'm not no. even going into education. It's, I don't even think it's possible to be a millionaire and have like those two things are not congruent. <laughs> right? Like they're not synonymous with each other at all. So I never got into it for making money. I always got into it. I got into it because I was angry at the system of what I was seeing of how the children were being treated. And I said, I am going to create the classrooms that I know the kids deserve. And that's why I got in to serve. And I stayed in for over two decades serving. Yeah, you, you kind of just went, went to go serve the humans and then you served the little humans. Right. <laughs> that's the end of it. Now you're back to serving all humans. <laughs> it's good it's good and I think that the people probably can resonate with that though because a lot of us do feel like well we're serving the humans in some way or I feel like I'm serving the humans even through this podcast you know right. it's it's uh it's a valid statement for helpers I think that, that mm-hmm. that's a calling to you just like mm-hmm. how can I help humanity how right. can the world be a better place how can it just not be so crappy in certain places right. like right. all of that <laughs> all of it yeah, if everybody could serve. I mean, you know, I like to dream. One of my strengths, I don't know if everybody's taken this um, strengths finder or the Gallup strengths, okay? And um, one of my top five strengths is futuristic. So I just constantly think about long after I'm gone, literally, long after I'm gone, what are the seeds that I am intentionally planting of trees I will never seek the shade under. That's the literally the sentence that keeps churning in my mind. And I just envision a world where if everybody could serve, even 1% of the day, I'm going to get up today and I'm going to serve somebody 1% of the day. How different. If we can all just, if I'm taking 5% more love or 1% more kindness, the world would look so much different than it does now but we just can't get our crap together to do it. And I think we're all probably doing it in our own little sphere with our own little web that we're not able to gather everything and all the things together the way it would be possible if we were able to really get that collective impact (laughs) and be like, you're over good at this and not so good at that. How do we leverage what you know? Like, how do we do this? Um, I I think about it like the community toolbox website, Mm -hmm. you know, like that's a good example of a place where people have just historically put a repository of information. But if it like went away, a whole bunch of helper type people would lose access to information that helps Mm -hmm. them do their jobs, right? It helps them be good people. Mm -hmm. But I'm like, how can we figure that out where it's it's a little more systematized, not dependent upon one group or one thing or one website, like that we're all able to access this. Um, And and I think what you're talking about too is, well, if it's it's pervasive in the organization, Mm -hmm. organizations are just working in this way or people are thriving, like some of these problems wouldn't exist and we wouldn't even need the tools anymore. (laughs) Right? I don't want the tools, right? At the end of the day, my, my thought is, I want to be out of a job. I want to be out of a job. And I know some people will be like, oh my God, is she really saying that live? Yes, I'm really saying that live. I don't want, do you think I want to really go into organizations because people are in pain and being harmed because the culture has impacted their wellness or because leadership lacks social emotional intelligence? No. And a lot of times it's reactionary. A lot of times it's also proactive and preventative. That's what we want, right? We want the people that are saying, you know what? We don't need this, but we need this. So we're going to just do the culture 
facilitation and assessment, not because something happened, but because we don't want anything to happen, right? It is getting insurance on the front end so that we aren't a social media headline, so that the New York Times didn't write us up talking about, oh, here we go again, like people are leaving and this is what was said and done. When are we going to get to a place that we don't have that? Uh, I, don't, I don't know when it's going to be preventative or, or proactive. That I'm not sure because right. I think that the upfront investment, people are always looking for the return on mm-hmm. that investment. And they're, if they don't see it quickly, they may not actually think that it's a valid or a good use of their their resources. Mm-hmm. But I, I love where you're going with um, all of these, these topics because it, it's so like thought-provoking to me. I have heard early in my career that idea of, make yourself so good at what you do that you work yourself out of the job yeah. as a helper as a and it was in the context of international development when I was in Uganda but it, it completely applies to every other experience I've had right. because in a sustainable way when you're able to turn solutions over to community members or build capacity or have organizations that function well like the, there there are these helper positions that are not necessary anymore and that's okay because right. that's a sustainable solution. Like that's where we're going. <laughs> right. right? Yeah. yeah. That's the point. That's the point. Oh, yeah. yeah. And if we made all these incremental improvements in different places and we were able to keep building and be building, you're right. It's going to take way beyond you and I to see what the positive outcome will be. But if we don't make any headway, then you're never going to get to whatever that future positive yeah. outcome is. So it, it's almost like we got to keep going. We got to keep doing it. The one thing I love about you, because I, I mean, I've known you for a while in terms of Ooh, online and yes. we connected and I, we just are like, hi, I love you. Hey. I said, I said, we're really good friends now online. And I'll, no, I had two questions for you because there's two things okay. I've seen you done really well. One um, question that I think a lot of small businesses and solopreneurs and people who are like accidental businesses struggle with marketing. Mm. Have you grown your link following to over yeah. 20, it's just this morning, we're 27,000, which is yeah. great. And um you've also set boundaries around how people connect with you yeah. on that platform and how people request your time and all these like amazing practices that I yeah. think people can learn from. So can you give people a little bit of insight into what does it mean to really kind of blow up your following in your own sphere and then have to control <laughs> and navigate that as well? Because you you just do, I think you do it beautifully. I, I appreciate how you, how you put it together, girl. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Okay, so here's what I'm gonna tell you. You know, you have to look at where you have to look at the journey because here's what I need people to first do. There are so many people, especially entrepreneurs, okay, or solopreneurs or mompreneurs, whatever you want to say it is, that will look at themselves and what do we do? We compare. So then people are looking at my LinkedIn profile and they're like, oh my gosh, she has 27 pounds. Okay. And then not looking at the, you would look at the snapshot. Okay. It's kind of the days when I was in the classroom as a teacher, we had a test that day. That is one snapshot in a person's life that doesn't define that kid, right? I am more than my test. I am more than my followers. I am more than this post. Seriously, right? Like people have to remember this. So I would say one, because I care about people's wellness, that will zap some people of their joy if you are looking at people in, in comparison. Okay. What people didn't see, some people saw and know this, the journey that I had, okay? So I literally wasn't really on social media. And I began, I think, when I started posting, I maybe had 500. I was so proud I had 500 connections because then it would say 500 plus at the top. I'm like, yes, I did it, okay? I had 500 connections. So I've literally gone from 500 connections to where I am right now in that short period of time, which is a huge celebration. However, I learned Because at the beginning, 2020, I was on a lot. 2020 and 2021, I was on a lot to the point where my kids, who were both at elementary school, were like, mommy, you're on LinkedIn again. Stay happy, be mindful, stay positive, right? They could repeat what I was telling people in my direct messages. Because if people connect with me, if you send me a message, a lot of times I will try my best to answer all the messages that I'm getting behind the scene, not posts in the DMs. So... It was then impacting my own wellness because I was literally trying to keep up with all of it. And what people don't also know is at that time, I was at the state level or in the district, I was working easily 60 to 70 hours a week. 
when in the state, when the 2020 just happened, because there were so many things that we had to do. On top of managing my own kids, two different curriculums because they were in two different grades. My husband was a frontline person. I had nobody at home here to save me. It was me doing it all by myself until he got home. Um, so I wouldn't prescribe what I did to anybody. That would not be the medicine that I would say you're going <laughs> to. This is not it. it. This, is, this is not. Don't do that. OK, so one, I think you have to be mindful of what is your goal, because your goal, whoever is listening to this right now, not may not be the same as my goal. There might be some people who are like, I don't want a lot of, right? I don't want a lot of followers because then what happens? What comes with a lot of the followers? I can't even tell you how many direct messages I get in any given day. And then you are going to have to keep up with that. And then you're going to have to keep up with all the comments that people post on your posts. So there is a lot of behind the scenes stuff that goes on and nobody manages my stuff. I manage it. Why? Because my voice is my voice. I don't want it curated by somebody else. I, I, that's something I've chosen not to do. So what I would tell people is one, drill down and sit with yourself on what's your goals, what's your short-term goals, what's your long-term goals. Do you know how to get there? Because some people do need help. Have I helped? I've helped businesses before with this same thing, their own marketing. So, so they don't know, right? Like marketing is not the same thing as content creation. Those are, those are not exactly the same. So do you are you talking about marketing? Are you talking about, hey, I want to get to the point where I'm a top voice or I'm considered an influencer? I, I don't know what your goals are, but you need to know that. So I think that's one. I think two then is know what you're trying to get into. What, what's your path? What I know my path. I stand in three areas. Three areas are wellness, social, emotional leadership, and equity. That's what I stand in. So that is the work that I do with organizations. It's what I help with. It's what I always talk about. So I think there's that. And then I think there's a, what are my boundaries? I had to, here, here's full transparency. I have, I think it's either four or 500. I haven't looked, sitting, waiting to connect with me. Now, I know some people will be like, what? And there's people sitting and waiting. The full honesty for me is I can't keep up with my DMs right now. So in good faith, I can't allow them to connect to me because then they have access to my DMs, which I can't even get to now. And I've chosen, I've seen a lot of other people, if this is the route you're taking, it's not my path, that you will send them a DM and they don't answer. I don't operate that way. I am trying, if you took the time to send me a message, I want to respect your time too, to message you back. So it's a bunch of different, I know this is a very long winded answer to every person has their own path and it's not a, here's, here's what it is for everybody because everybody doesn't have the same goals as me. Oh, I love, no, it's, it was not a long winded answer at all. It was the perfect answer because it, it's about the goals. It's about with who you're trying to connect right. to. It's about what your purpose is online. You know, if it's a business or a personal account right. that you're trying to get more followers for, I mean, you even mentioned um, that the pressure you feel when oh, people yeah. are DMing you and you can't respond. Yeah, right? I feel really bad. Yeah, I do. I do. And some people right. don't care, right? Like some people, I some feel people bad. Don't message back. I get it. And they're like, don't even care. I like literally, it bothers me sleeping at night. I think it's like that um, when people send you something in the mail and you're like, yeah, you know, you want to send me something and put a stamp on it and put it all the way in the mail. And I get it at my house and I don't even open it. I throw it in the trash. Like, I feel bad about it. And I even open the spammy ones on LinkedIn, right? Because there's a lot of spammy ones. And I'm like, and, and I tell them no. <laughs> me too. I do too. I apologize to tell them no. And like, yeah. in the beginning, it's still a conversation about why. And it's like, it, 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 I end up just deleting it at that point. But I, I, feel like I, I not that I'm obligated I don't have that many like so I can't say that it's pressure but I just feel bad that I received something and I didn't answer it now on the other side if somebody spammed my inbox and my email I'm gonna delete it in hot minutes so don't feel <laughs> like I don't even know why the LinkedIn DMs get like an extra play but um but I, I appreciate that and in your answer you sort of kind of went here but I want to go back here because okay. I think you have like probably a much more prescriptive way that you do this but you mentioned that when you were 
spending his amount of time online and seeing how it was progressing. It was progressing well, but you also had this thing at home that was not progressing well, which was the attention of your kids and, and being able to connect with them the way you wanted. So when you're serving others, sometimes you have to give, give, give of yourself, yeah. but then you're not able to really live the way you want to live. And can you talk a little bit about how that might have played out for you in that? And then what corrections you made or what wellness mm. routines, which I call a wellness recipe, like how did you correct and bring that wellness back into balance? Because I know like I get emails from you. It's like, I'm not working. I'm balancing right now. Y'all being chill. So, and I'm like, love you, <laughs> but love it. Um, but I, I, I appreciate that you have, I know you, you've done some work in this area. So can you enlighten folks into what that for you? Okay. So again, it, we go back to the social emotional leadership piece. I had to have an awareness that this was impacting me, not in the most positive sense. And you can't crash course correct if you don't even have the awareness that this is where you're at. That, that is the existence of why social emotional leadership is so important. So I got to the point where obviously my kids were saying that. My husband was like, you're up all, the, all these hours trying to like respond to these messages and these comments and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, yes, I am. And I am not functioning at my optimization level of my being, like my physical being, my spiritual being, my mental capacity being, because I was not getting as much sleep as I had required. So I said, okay, future, we have to now put harder boundaries into place because as much as I would love to give everybody access, everybody can't have access. I would take in like, um, people would be like, hey, could you do the coffee chat? I don't even drink coffee. FYI for everybody out there. I drink water. So I would do the coffee chats and then I would get on with people. I'm like, I can't even believe like I'm giving my time to like do literally is this what I'm doing? So I was like, OK, this all re it's all getting revamped at this point. We are literally recalibrating myself and we're revamping this. So then with the revamps, I was like, okay, what do I, where do I want to do this? And then I started to say, nope, Monday and Fridays for the most part, unless it's like urgency or I really don't have any time, people aren't getting me because I need to work on my future of SEL stuff. And then we will have meetings then middle of the week. I started to put, as you got my outgoing messages, I was like, no, if I'm off in September or December or whenever it is, or that day, you don't get to sneak in on my schedule now because it's convenient for you when it literally is going to impact my own wellness. So it was being intentional about, okay, here's the boundaries that I want to set. What am I going to do to put these boundaries into place and then hold myself accountable to it? It was linking out. I tell people, link out to link into you. I say that all the time. There's different quotes that I'm quoted for. That's one of them. And I was like, I can't be on here all the time. So if I'm detoxing a day or if I'm saying I'm only going on it for this hour, then that's what I needed to do. So I put it into practice and it is going, I could breathe and I feel much better. Oh, I'm so glad you can breathe. Yeah. And yeah, and, and it's such a great learning lesson for oh my gosh to you know hear you say it and then like just say put this in place before it happens to you like Please. we have a preventative measure <laughs> we do it seriously don't do as I did no <laughs> don't do it's like you know some parents will be like do as I say don't as don't do as I do I don't want to be that person I I'm not going to sit up here saying yeah I'm doing this about wellness or do that. It, I'm going to be do as I do. And I could walk you through it because I've stumbled, falled, and like had people step on me. But you don't have to do this too. You don't have to do it. Yeah. I I, I remember it's how you say those coffee chats. Cause man, I think when I was first starting, I had so many coffee chats that people didn't show up for or right. things on my schedule that were inconvenient to me, but it was convenient to someone else. Like when you said, oh yeah, take, take this call on your day off. And, you know, it, it, I, yes. I, all of those things. And I had to learn how to say no what? and not feel bad because no is a complete sentence. And it's helpful to me when I'm able to do the other things that I now have room for. Like, and I shouldn't feel bad that my day off is now me going paddle boarding <laughs> or me what? going hiking with the dog because and then instead of taking the call, 
I'm hiking with the dog with no cell reception. <laughs> right? But we feel bad. But people, I'm going to feel bad because essentially a lot of these people, like, unlike you, some of these people are strangers. <laughs> right? So I'm, and I feel bad for strangers. I don't want people to get me wrong. I care about all humanity. Literally, I do. We're still helping and, the human. <laughs> right? We're still helping the humans. However, at the same time, I'm, why should I feel bad for you, but frig me? Like, th- those two things should not be the same. I, my needs have to come first, but so, beside putting you first. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that's how you continue to show up and be right. there for others who are, you know, not, not even here yet in your sphere. <laughs> right? No, literally. Yeah. They'll show up tomorrow or the day after. So, you know, you, you can't just burn out today and then not be there for these other people that you know are going to be needing the support that you provide. And I think that is the cool thing about social entrepreneurship is that, you know, yes, we're making a profit and we're building our businesses and we're all excited about whatever thing that goes on that, you know, blows up, if anything. But any, any of it is exciting. You're like, yeah, yeah I did a thing. Why? Uh, but it's cool to see how the transformation happens. Yes. It really means like other people can then transform other people. And it's that ripple effect or that hit forward thing. So I'm just wondering for you, like, what is your big vision with all of this? Like if you had this audacious, like, oh man, this would be wicked cool if it was, if this happened out as a result of, of my efforts, like what does that look like for a future of SEL or just you as a person? My big vision. Ooh. You know, I don't think I'll see this before I take my final breath, okay? But my big, big vision is not even all workplaces. It's all schools. It's all communities. It's all spaces where faces are, which is everywhere, okay? That every human being is well. That every human being feels that they belong. That every human being is very much aware that what they say, what they do, has a huge impact on the next human being, whether you know them and whether you don't know them. And that's including our treatment of our earth. It's including our treatment of other humans. It's including our treatments of ourselves. So at the end of the day, in full seriousness, that's what I envision. And as much as I will try to live on this hill and I will die on this hill, I don't know if I'm going to see it before I take my final breath. Well, we'll keep coming back and trying, girl. <laughs> I am here yeah. with you. I love that vision. I, I'm, I, yeah, I'm, I think I'm in that vision too, that people have been able to thrive in every environment yeah. and have things like basic needs, safety, yeah. food, security, like all those things just be available for people not not be a fight anymore no. <laughs> a conversation we don't need to have right. again like that, that yeah I, I think it and I and I, I want to see it um like you said with the equity lens like really making these repairs over time because they do take a long time yeah. I don't know what if any of it I'll see in my lifetime but I do hope that that is a result of all of our efforts so I appreciate what you're doing I appreciate what all of the people in our community are doing and I think um, it's going to be people like this continuing to show up yeah. every day that are going to really make any stride in this direction, mm-hmm. to be honest. So, I agree. I agree. Yeah, so, and I, of course, all of us being friends helps out. So I think I'm here with a good connect, get all our tools together in the toolbox. Mm-hmm. Um, I appreciate you so much. It's so good to have you. And I just wanted to give you a moment to tell people, I know it's futureofsel.com mm-hmm. is your website but any other places that you want folks to connect with you and what um, what they can do to support you or get support from you? Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm on LinkedIn. That's, that's my platform where I have built the most relationships is what I will say. I am on Instagram and, and Twitter and TikTok. I don't do those as actively. Instagram would, would, would be next. I'm trying, but you know, it's me, right? It's me and I want to put out the content the way I want to put it out. So it will get out there when it can. Uh, I would say if people want to go, you can go to my website. Obviously, I speak all over. I've spoken internationally. So if people are looking for a conference or somebody to come in to do workshop facilitation or culture facilitations, they could reach out to me. 
Or if you're just looking to chat, I've had people come in my DMs of like, I'm really struggling, right? I will, as, as much as I can help somebody, I will try to help anybody. So even if it's a question of, hey, can you give me some tips on wellness? I would tell people there's literally a free downloadable on my website of things, little reminders of what to remember for charging your own battery. So that's what I would tell people. I would also tell them um, what I say, what, what, what my kids uh, were quoting me on is stay healthy, be mindful and stay positive because I truly believe we're, this is a mental marathon. And how are you pouring into you? Because you only get one. It's such a beautiful closing message. I love it. <laughs> You're so good. And this is why when I was excited at the beginning of the episode, people were like, yeah, man, she killed it. They're what? <laughs> like, so I, I mean, I, I, I knew you would, obviously, but I love this conversation. I had such a blast just hearing all your thoughts and, and how your journey has evolved and just kind of giving us a peek behind the scenes of what it's like to go through that just evolution of your of your own purpose and i'm so excited to have you as a friend so can't wait till we're in the same space in person girl oh, okay. yeah yes. right. yeah we gotta we gotta get our sticker situation <laughs> coordinated yes. I I know. Know. oh my gosh yes but it was so great to see you and i'm just excited to have you as someone in my network and in the collective so thank you for being here and um, to all the listeners, come back for another episode with another amazing social entrepreneur, just like Future. So this has been Future Kane telling us all about social emotional learning and the future of SEO. Thank you for joining us for another episode of the Social Impact Level Up podcast. It's been awesome to interview today's guest, and I hope that you leave inspired to take action. If you're looking for any of the information we spoke about, it's probably down in the show notes. Make sure that you're checking them out and you're clicking on any of the links that seem exciting to you. If you are looking for a coach or a consultant to help you with your social impact or your sustainability, reach out to me via my, via my website, hop on my email list, or jump into one of my programs. All of the links are below. So excited to have you as part of the collective. Make sure that you come back and join us for another episode next week.